morning here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's a little chilly outside. Let's all stand together and thank the Lord for his goodness. Heather, would you ask the Lord to bless our service, please? Yes, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house this evening. We thank you for this nice, warm place we have to worship you. We ask that you would bless the songs and bless the service, and that it all be in your name. Amen. Praise, Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's start the chorus, book number 18, coming down, down, down.
over me. I've got that one there, there for you. And he's keeping it up.
pray once again as for God's leading and guiding this evening. Heavenly Father, I do thank you. Lord Jesus, what a blessing to be gathered together with the family of God to rejoice and to praise you and to thank you, dear Lord God, and to come to you, Lord Jesus, no matter how big or how small we think our problem might be, our concern might be, Lord, that you are always there, and Father, that you always have an answer. And so, God, we are so blessed. And tonight, dear Lord Jesus, as we are able to gather to be with you, I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you would just anoint the words and anoint the ears that receive. Help us all, dear Lord God, to recognize the power of your word, the power of your spirit, and to give us, dear Lord Jesus, overcoming power to rise up over and above anything that the enemy might try to do to us. Lord God, we thank you that we have victory in you and that you, dear Lord Jesus, are never defeated. And so, God, as we march with you, we know we are marching in victory. And I thank you, Father, for the people that have gathered this evening. And I pray now, Lord, just bless this word and may it be for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are, of course, so very, very blessed. And uh, one of the many blessings that we have is, of course, God's Word. And God's Word provides us with so much in the way of instruction, so much in the way of uh, encouragement. And sometimes it's also um, there to uh, reprimand and to get us back on the proper road. But it's all part of God's plan, and, and God has provided in such a wonderful way. And so we can look, and this evening we're going to look into the scripture, and we can take a look at the examples that God chose to um, provide us with. You know, And we have to recognize that this is only a very small glimpse at the many, many people that the Lord moved through. Right? There are all kinds of lives and all kinds of people that I believe will meet in glory that, uh, you know, did something for the Lord, were touched by one of the disciples, uh, you know, worked in one of the churches, maybe in Ephesus or in Corinth. All these people that uh, we don't know yet, but we will come to know. And so the Lord picked out uh, certain circumstances and individuals. I believe he chose them so that we could learn from them. Uh, we learn about how they overcome, we learn about their faith and how they held on to their faith, and we also learn about the tactics of the enemy. And this is a good thing, not to uh, ever give the devil any kind of place or glory, but so that we're aware. And that's an important thing. And it's really one of the great blessings I find myself in the scripture because I can look and I can read about, you know, what the enemy was trying to do and how the Lord intervened, and in the end I can always see victory. And that helps me as I'm going through my journey. It also reminds me, just as a sort of an aside, that there are people today in the world that might be looking at you and looking at me. And in a similar way, they're watching to see, well, how is that person going to react to that situation? What are they going to do when that happens to them? And just as we can look into the Bible and we can see how people reacted to what was happening to them there, and we see good examples, every one of us has opportunity today to be good examples. Because, in a sense, we're kind of a living testimony, uh, should be, of what the Lord is doing today. Just like the scripture is a living word that tells us about how the people handled situations and how God met their needs and helped them in days gone by. And so, this evening, uh, we're going to take a look at Nehemiah, but we're going to start with a verse in 1 Corinthians. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
and just one verse, I'm picking this one out here, and it's verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14 and 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So if God is not the author of confusion, then we can draw the conclusion very easily that the devil is the author of confusion. And when we look at the world today, I've spoken on this sort of, and mentioned this a number of times, we see great confusion. But it's not just the world today where, the, where Satan, where the, the devil, has tried to use confusion to cause God's people to turn away from the Lord. I believe that's what he's trying to do today. And it's, it's so bad today, really, that he's infiltrated into so-called Christian churches so that the gospel itself isn't being preached the way it should be preached, the way it's stated in the Bible, and so that even Christians themselves are confused if they look at one church and one church says, this is okay, and then they look at another church and that church says, no, that's not what the Bible says, and another one says, yes, that's okay according to the Bible. And that, of course, does nothing but weaken God's people and cause great, great confusion. So the devil is the one who is trying to confuse you and me today. And his reason for that, and what we're going to see in Nehemiah, his reason for that, one of the reasons, is to try and get God's people to stop doing God's work. You see, if he can stop God's people from doing the work that the Lord is instructing them to do be, by confusing them, or causing confusion in the camp, so to speak, then that's exactly what the devil wants. And actually, he would like to take it even further because he wants Christians to turn away from God by confusing them. I was reminded as I was preparing for this particular uh, message that my name and yours, I trust, is written in the Lamb's Book of Life because God put it there. He offered us this gift of salvation, right? The Lord offers us that gift. And if we accept, it's God who puts our name in that book of life. We have to remember that the devil cannot erase your name or my name from that book of life. But what he's trying to do is confuse God's people so that we ourselves turn away from the Lord, thus causing God to remove our name. See, the devil doesn't have the power to take away my salvation. You have to remember that. The devil cannot take away my salvation. But he will try and cause confusion. And confusion takes away peace. And in that tumult that the devil tries to create, some of God's people turn away from God. So this confusion that the Bible talks about is really one of Satan's weapons to try and get God's people to turn away from the Lord, thus losing their salvation. Okay? So I want to take a look in Nehemiah at an example of confusion that isn't new, it's the same thing, and you know, I also say this and over and over and over again, and you should know this by now, the methods that the devil uses are not new. And that's a real blessing for us, because God has described them very, very well in the Bible. Okay? There's no secret attack. There's no secret weapon that God doesn't know about and that God doesn't have an answer for. 
So when we look at Nehemiah chapter 6, Nehemiah chapter 6, I'll give you an opportunity to turn there. Of course, Nehemiah was building the wall. Right? You'll remember, he was sent and he was building the wall that had been destroyed. And, and I want you to think about Nehemiah's task, right? It was a very natural thing that he was doing, but he was led by the Spirit to do it. You see, God uses people like you and like me. He uses people as his tools to get natural things done. And Nehemiah had been given a task, I believe, by God to rebuild the wall that had been broken down and destroyed and, and left in ruin. And the enemy doesn't want that to happen. Okay? Now, we're aware of the events here, but we're going to read them through. And I want you to look at them, and I want you to consider as we're reading this, and again I say, that the devil hasn't changed his tactics. And so just like Satan uses his disciples to try and stop Nehemiah from getting the job done, the devil today still uses his disciples to try and get God's Christians today, you and I, to stop getting God's work done. Okay? So he's going to try. This, see, the devil always tries. But if we put our faith and trust in the Lord, and if we do like God tells us to do, just like Satan always tries, he always fails. He always will fail if we do what God tells is asking us to do. Okay? So, Nehemiah chapter 6. And I want you to look, and we're going to take a quick look, uh, as I read here. We're going to read oh, almost all of the chapter, so we'll get moving here. Uh, because it's really hard to sort of take pieces out. Because I want you to see what's happening. So, Nehemiah 6 verse 1. Now it came to pass, when Sambalat and Tobiah and uh, Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies. Now, so notice right away, Nehemiah knows who the enemies are. Right? He calls them our enemies. And we'll come to why he knows that in a minute. Heard that I had builded the wall, and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time... I had not set up the doors upon the gates. That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. Now, how did he know that? How did he know? Well, he knew they were his enemies. Then I can ask the same question. How did he know that they were his enemies? Um, let me just jump, and we're going to come back to this a number of times. Go quickly to verse 12. And lo, I perceived. And that's where I want you to stop. This word perceived. Okay? You see, Nehemiah had been gifted by God to perceive to understand, to recognize, to see, not through natural eyes alone, but more importantly through spiritual eyes. Nehemiah was able to perceive what was really going on. And this is an important gift that we need to ask the Lord for today. Okay? Because if we can perceive what's really going on, it gets rid of confusion. What is confusion? Confusion, if you think about it in a natural, is when somebody's standing, perhaps at a crossroads, and they say, well, I don't know which way to go. Do I go this way? Looks okay. Do I go that way? That looks okay. Do I just stay here? Do I go back? What am I supposed to do? 
That's confusion. Okay? But God is not the author of confusion. The enemy is. And one of the ways that the Lord helps us, can help us, is by giving us the ability to perceive, to see what is the truth, what is the way to go. Nehemiah was a person just like we are. Now he had an office, and he had power, yes, but he was still a person just like us. Some of you may be even more intelligent than Nehemiah was. I have no idea. Okay? But Nehemiah had God on his side. That's what makes the difference here. And so right away, he says, our enemies, in that first verse. And you see, as they were trying to lure him away, as they were trying to distract him, and that's one of the tactics that Satan uses, as they were trying to distract him from getting the gates. See, most of it was done, right? He says the walls were up by this point in time. And there had been lots of attempts to stop him even before this. But the enemy doesn't stop just because you're almost done. He's there right from the beginning. And so here, as he's almost finished, and he almost has the gates in place, Along come these people again, and they say, let's have a meeting. Let's meet in a village somewhere. Okay? And you notice Nehemiah's response. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Do you see what they were trying to do, right? You see, they wanted to remove Nehemiah from the work so the work would stop. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do. He wants to distract you. He wants to distract God's church today. He wants to distract pastors today. So that they will wander away from the work that God has put them in charge of. Now, I'm not saying you can't take a holiday or you can't be whatever, but it has to be led by the Lord. Okay? And here the enemy was trying to draw him away. And Nehemiah, he's not rude. He's rather, you know, polite in the sense. He's just very plain. And he says, why should I go so that the work of the Lord will stop? And you notice he recognized, as he says it here in verse 3, I am doing a great work. Anything we do for the Lord, I think, and I believe, is a great work. No matter how small people might think it is. Okay? When we do something for the Lord, not for ourselves, but if we do it for His honor and His glory, guess what? It's a great work. And so Nehemiah recognized that. All right? And he says, yet they sent unto me four times after this sort. And I answered them after the same manner. What does that tell you? The devil doesn't give up easy. He doesn't take no for an answer. He's always ready to come back again. And that's why we have to be always prepared to respond in Jesus' name. Because the devil is always going to be trying. Like I said before, he tries and he tries and he tries. So they sent these people with a letter. He said no. Okay, It doesn't tell us how much time went by here. We don't know if it was a week, right? Because in those days it wasn't like today. It wasn't an email that's instantly there. Somebody had to bring the letter. And then they had to take... Nehemiah's response back again, and then they have to bring another letter. So there's time that is taking place here, but the enemy doesn't give up. And God's people should also not give up. Nehemiah did not compromise. He was firm. I'm doing a good work. So I'm going to stick to the task that God has given me to do. So they did this four times. Verse 5, then sent Sambalat, his servant unto me, in like manner, the fifth time, so here he comes again, 
all right, with an open letter in his hand. Now, it's a different letter this time. Notice, the devil changes his tactic. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gash saith it, saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shalt it be reported to the king according to these words. Come thou therefore, and let us take counsel together. What are they doing now? Well, they're telling lies. False news, fake news. They're attacking his character. See, the devil wants to do that, right? He wants to take your life and drag it through the mud. And if there's nothing there, and there shouldn't be with God's help, then he'll lie about it. And we saw that, we see that actually in the New Testament, right? When they, the disciples stood before the court, when they stood before the high priests, the Bible tells us they paid people to come in and lie. And that's exactly what's happening here, right? They made up stories, made it look like Nehemiah was doing things for his own glory, and they tried to cause him to fear, all right? And so it says here in verse 8, eight Then I sent unto them, saying, there, is no, there are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. In other words, you make them up. You're making up stories here out of your own heart. And remember, that own heart, that was the devil's heart. These are the devil's disciples that are working for Satan here, okay? So they were doing the devil's doing. But verse 9 tells us, For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it is that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. So Nehemiah gives us a little bit of insight here. Okay, he was a little bit afraid here. Okay, because now they were talking about sending information to the king to make it look like Nehemiah is basically, you know, a rebel. And he's going to take over or try and have his own kingdom. And Nehemiah was a little bit afraid of that. He tells us that. Okay? Because the enemy was trying to weaken his hands. But notice what Nehemiah does. And this is, again, something we can learn from this. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah prayed, knowing that he was in the right and that God would protect him. Now, what the Bible gives us there, that's not a real long prayer, is it? If that's the whole prayer, and it could have been, Oh God, strengthen my hand. Five words. So our prayers don't necessarily have to be long, but they have to be sincere from our heart. And so Nehemiah prays. And, you know, the Lord, I believe, helps him but the devil's not finished yet. Okay? And in the next section, afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabil, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, wherein uh, within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee, yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. So now they were attacking Nehemiah's life. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that, being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, where we read before, I perceive that God had not sent him. So what's the devil doing now? False prophets. Somebody came as a prophet of God, right? And it seems pretty reasonable. They're going to come and kill you at the night. At night, come on, let's run into the church, into the temple. Sounds okay. But that wasn't God's will. 
And this is, again, why it's so important that we have the right abilities to perceive, to understand what's really going on, okay? Verse 12 again, And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Salabat had hired him. He was a prophet for hire. Right? And I think, I think today in the world, we have lots of prophets for hire. And they're not doing or saying what the Lord wants them to do. Verse 13, Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon, sorry, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that they should have put me in fear. And so the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month, Elu, uh, in fifty and two days. Okay? So, what did I pull from this? What can you take from this? Well, my uh, title is Open My Eyes. See, Nehemiah, as he perceives, it's really God opening his eyes spiritually to what's going on around him. What is the goal? Right? Nehemiah had to keep his eyes on the goal and not look at what the enemy was doing or hear what they were saying, but he had to have his eyes opened. And the Bible tells us, right, if you go to Ephesians for a moment, in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1 and verse 18, Here Paul is writing, and he writes to the church in Ephesus, and one of the things he says to them, in verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You see, God needs to open our eyes. You might say, well, my eyes are open. I've been saved for X number of years, and the Lord is moving through my life, and I'm doing God's work. Well, praise the Lord for that. But just like every morning we wake up, and our eyes open, our natural eyes, every day, I believe, we need to ask the Lord, Lord, open my eyes so that I may see. Today. Because the enemy, he's not taking a holiday, is he? And Nehemiah, see, he couldn't just pray, open my eyes so I see that this letter that is coming is a trick. No, he couldn't just stop there. Because the next time, the devil used a different tactic. And then after that, the devil sent a false prophet. You see, we have to have our eyes open. We have to have that ability to perceive all the time. Because one day, Satan might come in one way. And I have to ask God, help me to see it. And then the next day, the devil might try and come a different way. And again, I have to be praying, Lord, help me to see it. Help me to perceive. Help me to understand. Right? Because that's what the scripture says here. Right? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Okay? A revelation of what is really happening around us. What is the devil really doing here? Is this really... Does it, it looks really good, but is that true? Well, God always knows. And we have to ask God to help us to see it. And likewise, we have to ask the Lord to help others to see as well. In 2 Kings... Yeah, 
In 2 Kings, chapter 6, this is uh, Elisha. Elisha prays the following. And I, I, I'm using this verse because I believe the Lord wants us to pray for the unsaved so that they would also have their eyes opened. Right? I mean, we have loved ones, we have people that we might work with, neighbors, and we want God to open their eyes so that they would also see. And so in, in 2 Kings 6 and verse 17, it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. See, until God opened the eyes of the servant, the servant thought, we're done. But we can pray, not only Lord, and we must pray, open my eyes. But we can also pray for others and ask God to open theirs. And when our eyes are open, guess what? Confusion disappears. When the Bible speaks about the light and the dark, right? It's using images that, to help us understand because often, we are most confused in the dark. That's a time when it's easy in the natural to get lost. We lose our bearings, right? You know, sometimes bright lights are shining in our eyes if you're driving or whatever it happens to be. And we can't see the signs as clearly. Or if it's a big snowstorm or it's raining like crazy or whatever. That's when there can be a spirit of confusion. Naturally. And the same thing happens spiritually. And when we're confused, we lose our peace. That's when, that's what happens. And that's exactly what Satan wants. But that's when the Bible teaches us to pray, Lord, open my eyes. In other words, Lord, help me to understand. Help me to see that you're still here. That you're still in control. That you're still moving. That God is still on the throne. And help me to see that Satan is defeated. And when we see that in our spirit, then we have that peace that the Bible speaks about. Because confusion is gone. And then we can say, Lord, thank you for the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for the peace in the midst of the storm. Right? I mean, there's so many examples, I hope, that come to your mind then, right? When I said that peace in the midst of the storm, I, I'm reminded of Jesus in the boat and the disciples in a panic. Right? Why were they in a panic? Well, they forgot that God's in control. They forgot that Christ was in the vessel. And so they were in a panic. Confusion! But then when the Lord speaks to that storm, peace. Confusion is gone. Okay. And so when Satan comes and he tries to get us off track, help us to be able to perceive what he wants, how he's trying to do that, by asking God, open my eyes that I might see and that I put my trust and faith in you. So let's all stand together. And thank and praise the Lord for his goodness and his blessings. Because we have so many, many blessings. And as I said earlier, you know, I, we, so we take much for granted. It's unfortunate, but we do. Right? And on a cold day like today, I have to be reminded, and I am reminded, Lord, thank you. Or the shelters that we have, right? You know, our homes might not be the biggest castles, and they might not have the most amazing, refined things that the world might look at, but hey, guess what? When it's freezing cold, like it is right now, right? 
Would anybody here want to sleep outside tonight? Not me. Not me. Right? And I don't really care, personally, now. I don't really care if it's that person's own fault or if it's somebody else's fault. Okay? The fact is, sleeping outside tonight, that's going to kill you. That's going to kill you. And it's going to keep... It's, it's cold, isn't it? Not as cold as in the States. Just as an aside, I saw a thing this morning that with the cold air, and there's a mountain somewhere near Washington, D.C., on the top of the mountain, they're predicting they will hit minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I looked at that and I couldn't believe. What? Minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's really, really cold. Right? And in the midst of coldness, and now let's talk about it spiritually for a second. Right? The world is cold spiritually. But God, thank you for the warmth. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your protection. Because that makes me warm. Because we are sheltered in his arms. So we have much, much, much to thank and praise the Lord for. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, as I've just finished saying, we thank you. And every one of us, I'm sure, should and can come up with a big, long list of the many ways you have blessed us, the many things that we thank you for. And Lord Jesus, as we have opportunity to be examples, just like, really, Nehemiah for us today is an example. Help us, help me, help all of us to be examples today to those around us that would try to cause us to fall, would try to cause us to falter, be distracted, to stop doing the work that, Lord, you're asking us to do. But God, help us to hang on. Help us, dear Lord Jesus, to be rooted and grounded in the rock that, dear Lord Jesus, we know you do not change, you do not shake, you do not falter or crumble. And so, dear Lord God, we have this opportunity to be a testimony to the world around us, to say, no, we're not turning from the path that the Lord has put us on. We're not going to step away from the straight and narrow way. We're not going to compromise on the Word of God. And what the Lord says is wrong, is wrong. And what the Word of God says is right, is right. And it doesn't matter what the world says, what the people say. What does God say? Help us, dear Lord Jesus, in love to make those statements. And to keep working. To keep working. So that the world will see. So that the world will acknowledge that there's something different in us, in those people, in God's people. Lord, help us as we sang tonight, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Help me to be different. A place, dear Lord Jesus, where you can dwell within and you can work through everyone that's here, every one of your children, every missionary that's working for your honor and for your glory. Lord, move through them to be those examples that people will talk about. I'm sure, Lord, that people talked about Nehemiah. That they looked at him and they said, well, why didn't he stop? And how did he know that this was a trick? And always the glory and the honor comes back to God. Always it is because the Lord showed Nehemiah. And dear Lord, I pray, help us to be the same. That God, we give you praise, honor, and glory. That you are leading us. That you will guide us. That you will open our eyes so that we can perceive what the truth is in the midst of the confusion. And let that confusion be ended. Let that confusion, Lord God, 
be pushed away, pushed aside, but in Jesus' name, so that we, as God's people, have a spirit of peace. Because we're trusting in you, Lord. We're holding firm. God, you've put us on this path. You've given us this job to do. And we're not changing unless you, Lord, tell us to do it. Thank you, Father, for your assurances and how we can just rest in your arms each and every day. We thank you, Father, for moving on lives. And we're going to pray now, Lord God, for the many that don't have that peace. See, Satan, he's always trying to rob it. He's always trying to take it away. But God, you can restore. You can restore. And dear Lord Jesus, that's what we're believing for tonight. Open my eyes that I might see. In Jesus' name, amen.